Thanks for tuning in today to learn more about the role of residual neuromuscular blockade in respiratory compromise. As a quick review, for those who aren't quite sure what respiratory compromise is, we can look through this. If we start at the far right, respiratory failure is something that we're all very familiar with. It's really when the lungs really stop their functioning and we get a buildup of carbon dioxide and a reduced amount of oxygen in the blood. Notably, this is one of the most common perioperative and postoperative complications. We know that respiratory insufficiency is something that precedes respiratory failure. So our ability to identify that and intervene can help with patient outcomes. With respiratory insufficiency, the lungs fail to remove carbon dioxide or provide enough oxygen in the blood. And that can be due to a number of things such as low respiratory rate, a reduction in oxygen saturation, or some change in arterial blood gases. Even before respiratory insufficiency and well before respiratory failure, respiratory compromise can be identified. This is our real opportunity to get patients back on track before they suffer a complication. Respiratory compromise has a high likelihood of decompensation that can lead down a pathway that is bad for patient outcomes. But if we can identify interventions early, patient outcomes can be much better. When not diagnosed, consequences can be, in fact, fatal. We know that respiratory compromise is really the second leading avoidable safety issue in the United States. It's the fifth leading condition, increasing hospital costs, third most rapidly increasing cost to inpatients in the hospital, more than 60% of respiratory arrests in the hospital are thought to be avoidable if they can be identified early. We also know that almost 14 patients out of 1,000 experience respiratory failure after surgery. And in 2007, almost $8 billion was spent on respiratory compromise, respiratory insufficiency, and respiratory failure that potentially could be an avoided cost. Those numbers continue to grow. When respiratory compromise occurs, the patient's mortality increases dramatically by up to 30%, and ICU stays increase almost 50%. So what are some things we can do to prevent respiratory compromise from occurring? On this slide, there are many, many causes identified that can suppress respiratory function. On the left column, you see syndromes or causes that may really result in a decrease in respiratory function. And on the right column, you can see the drug, right, that may be associated with that syndrome or situation. So while we know that alcohol and opioids and sedatives and hypnotics and things of that nature decrease respiratory drive, then we also know that different myopathies decrease the ability of the musculature to work and for patients to have good vital capacity. Today, we'll focus on neuromuscular blockade, things that reduce function pharmacologically that need to be considered as contributors to respiratory compromise, which can lead to insufficiency and certainly to failure. This quick talk is only going to focus on neuromuscular blocking agents which are used so commonly in surgery and critical care settings in hospitals every day. Note though, that many of the drugs that we list on the right are used concurrently. Often in surgery, we use opioids and hypnotics. And we also use antibiotics. We fix electrolytes with magnesium, for example, all of which contribute to decreasing neuromuscular function and enhancement of neuromuscular blockade when neuromuscular blocking agents are used. So why do we use them? We use them for four real broad reasons. First of all, to facilitate intubation as a safety issue and to be able to quickly, safely, and easily um, 
place an endotracheal tube into the trachea, neuromuscular blocking agents are commonly used. Further, we use them to facilitate mechanical ventilation when rest of the musculature is needed so that ventilation can be established. This is common both in the operating room and in the critical care units. During surgery, we use it to facilitate surgical exposure. Relaxing the musculature groups helps surgeons identify the areas that they need to work in. And we also use it for safety, particularly in surgery or in the critical care units when movement or patient movement could be deleterious. Neuromuscular blocking drugs can be reversed or antagonized, if you will, uh, when we are finished using them. There are two approaches to doing that. The first one is neostigmine, which belongs to an anticholinesterase inhibitor group. And the second is sugamidex, which is a gamma cyclodextrin. We'll first focus on neostigmine. Neostigmine has very indirect action. It prevents the breakdown of acetylcholine by antagonizing acetylcholinesterase. When that is accomplished, the acetylcholine levels will rise at the neuromuscular junction, thereby causing return of neuromuscular function. Neostigmine has significant side effects. You typically can see cholinergic side effects like bronchospasm, bradycardia, and medriasis, for example, when it's not combined with an anticholinergic drug. Those are undesirable side effects. And so oftentimes it is almost always utilized with an anticholinergic drug. Note that the peak effect of neostigmine is about 20 minutes. And so the, therefore the timing to the peak effect uh, is a little bit delayed and certainly not instantaneous. And the half-life is anywhere from 24 to 113 minutes. This can be concerning depending on the amount of neuromuscular blocking drug that was used in total dose or in total duration. And so concerns that we have both in the perioperative space and in the critical care space is that the quantity of neuromuscular blocking drugs still on board exceeds the ability for these drugs to reverse the actions. So that has to be considered much like we see with naloxone, for example, reversing opioids, we know that the naloxone may not last as long as the opioid's duration of action is. The same can be true with neuromuscular blocking reversal drugs as well. So Gamadex has a more direct action. It encapsulates rocuronium molecules, for example, renders them inactive, and they get excreted through the kidney. This is a newer drug with a peak effect of less than uh, three minutes and the half-life a little bit longer at two hours. But nonetheless, the same principles apply with Sugamidex as they do with neostigmine, where reparalysis is a concern. So monitoring for reparalysis becomes very important to all clinicians, both in the perioperative space and in the critical care environment. The concentration of neuromuscular blocking drug can be greater than the reversal agent and therefore incomplete uh, recovery occurs and we don't have complete return of neuromuscular function. Also, some of the agents, as I mentioned earlier, have a lower or shorter duration of action than the agent that they're reversing. And so we worry about someone who may demonstrate strength and clinical recovery but in 90 minutes or, or two hours later, may be weak again. The other reason that we see re reparalysis is that we don't monitor properly and we don't realize that we have full or less than full return of neuromuscular function. How do we identify these patients for respiratory compromise early? Some of the things to think about are, what was the total dose of neuromuscular blocking agent or the duration if it's an infusion in the critical care unit? What was the dose of the reversal agent that was used? Do we see shallow breathing in these patients? Or are they weak? Are they telling us that they're weak, that they can't get their breath, or they feel as though they can't breathe? Maybe they can't tell us, 
but you can realize that the respiratory effort is minimal or reduced. These patients are at risk for aspiration because residual neuromuscular blockade prevents the fine muscles of our upper respiratory tract and pharyngeal muscles from clearing secretions and protecting our airway. We may see desaturation a little bit later down the road. And we also may see an, a sedative effect as the P patient's PaCO2 increases because their depth of ventilation is low, which causes the CO2 to rise and then does have a sedating effect. All sort of creating a vortex or respiratory compromise that can lead to insufficiency, that can lead to failure and bad outcomes. So today's purpose was really to make residual um, neuromuscular blockade awareness to you so that you're, you can look for it in the clinical setting and when it is identified can be promptly treated. Thanks for joining.